What's up, Knife World? This is Ryan from Knife Pivot Loop here today to talk about one of the knives that I think is just pure genius. That is the Manix II. It's a knife I like so much that I own three of them. Here today we've got with us a Spyderco Manix II in M390 steel, a Spyderco Manix II lightweight in CTS XHP, and a Manix II in 52100 carbon steel. The standard Manix features G10 blades. That is a mixture of glass fabric and an epoxy or resin binder, which holds them together. That makes for a very durable and very grippy handle scale. The lightweight version features fiberglass reinforced copolymer plastic material, which also makes for just a bulletproof knife handle. Not quite as grippy naturally on its own. This is a fairly slick material, but if you can see here, they have molded into these blades some very small and sharp ramps. They call it bi-directional texturing, and that allows your thumb or finger to just lock into these knives really, really well, despite their being made out of a slick plastic. It's an excellent material, very lightweight. No steel liners in these to add extra weight, and they feature a wire clip, which reduces weight even further. A great knife if you're looking for something lightweight. Today, we are going to be talking about and working on this knife here in M390. We will move the other two off to the side. All right, why do I think the Maddox is one of the greatest knife designs ever made? Well, it comes down mostly to ergonomics. This knife might be the most ergonomic folder I have in my collection and that I've ever handled. It is ergonomic when it's held down low like this in the extended position so that you get more reach out of the blade. It is also extremely ergonomic when you choke up on it and place your index finger here in this choil, giving you more control over the blade for up close work. It is just an excellent knife. It also features Spyderco's leaf blade, which Spyderco is famous for. Spyderco uses this leaf, leaf blade on many of their knives because it offers an excellent balance of piercing ability with that low and controllable tip. It gives you just enough belly to get EDC tasks done, but also gives you lots of controllability, similar to a Warncliffe or an Insingo uh, by Chris Reeve. Also, the way Eric designed this knife, when you grip the knife, you end up placing that blade at a nice biased angle toward what you're going to be cutting. So as you work on cutting that item, the tendency for the blade to want to rotate and slip off the cutting task is going to be countered by all this leverage you have on the handle down here while the blade's cutting at that angle. It makes for a very aggressive cutting knife and just an excellent EDC tool. Furthermore, this knife features an excellent locking mechanism. This is the very strong and robust caged ball bearing lock from Spyderco. Inside this plastic piece right here is a hardened steel ball bearing. When the knife is locked in the open position like this, that ball bearing is squished between a portion of the blade itself and this hardened steel backspacer right here on the back of the knife. In order for the blade to fail or for the lock to fail when the knife is open, you would actually have to crush that ball bearing between two pieces of hardened steel. That same ball bearing functions as the detent for the blade when it is closed so that you get that bias towards closing and a nice deployment action when you flick the knife. It's also very easy to close the knife by simply pulling back on those grippy plastic pads here and allowing the blade to fall shut all by itself. It's an excellent tool. Let's take a look what makes it awesome from the inside. While we're busy taking it apart, we're going to be replacing the current ball bearing cage with this new one made out of titanium by Flytanium. I'll include a link to this below. They are not very expensive and we're doing it just because I think titanium is cool. Certainly not a necessary modification, but one that we're gonna do here on the channel today. Let's get started with the disassembly. To help us today, I've got a kit by Journey Tool Company. They make perhaps one of the highest quality sets of drivers I've ever seen. Of course, they feature the best lube on the market, Knife Pivot Lube. It's all premium products in here. Aaron, who manufactures these himself out of Oregon, has his own ball bearings manufactured for these drivers. They function as a fidget spinner with that excellent ball bearing in them. They're made out of 6AL4V titanium. They feature this excellent driver stamp with spots for all of your tools to fit in in case you want to keep this on a desktop. They also have very excellent texturing 
on the handle. These shallow grooves that are machined out of the handle give you lots of grip for turning those screws that are really locked tighted in. And if you need extra leverage on that driver, you've got the turner tool here, which you can slip over the driver itself to give you even more leverage to get that thing turning when you need. For today's disassembly, we will need T10 and T8 drivers from this kit. Pull those out here along with the driver itself. All right, and we'll get started by removing all of the screws from the show side of the knife. All right, now that we've got those screws out, it's time to remove this lanyard ferrule from the back of the knife. This is actually flared open to fit very tightly into the scales of this model of knife as well as of the paramilitary too. If you're gonna be disassembling these with any kind of regularity, I'd recommend picking up this tool. This comes from a company called Shark Dress Knives. It is a ferrule press, which allows you to remove this ferrule without damaging that G10 scale. Uh, if you try to just pry this scale up, what you'll tend to do is cause breakage of the fiberglass right back here which is obviously not ideal. To use this tool, you simply slide it between the two scales of the knife, and then center this screw press here in that fit within that ferrule. As you screw that down, it's going to work to pull the scale and liner away from that lanyard ferrule and release them. Once you've pressed them out, and go ahead and loosen this tool, remove it, and off comes the scale without any trouble at all. Same goes for the liner. We're gonna use the press to remove that. And there we go. The next step is going to be to remove one of the screws from the other side of the knife. We don't have to remove all of them to do this modification or to see what's going on inside the knife we are going to remove this rear screw that holds in place the lock retainer. All right, once we've removed that screw, we can go ahead and get underneath this spring and pop that up out of its retainer right here. We wanna be careful so that we don't lose the screw because it is under some tension and we don't want it to go flying across the room. But if we just wedge something gently underneath the spring and give it a bit of force upward, it will come out We can remove that and then it's easy enough to rotate up this retainer here, pull back the locking mechanism, and then gently lift the blade out of its place on the knife. All right, while we've got the knife apart, we can see how this knife actually functions. With the cage removed, we can see that when the blade is in the open position, we have this space here between the housing on the back and the tang of the blade here. And into that space fits this ball bearing. It ends up getting itself wedged in between these two parts right here. It does not allow the knife to close without it crushing that ball bearing. When you pull back the ball bearing, that allows the knife to rotate closed. And then again, in the closed position, that ball bearing acts as both a detent and as a blade stop to prevent the blade from crashing into the ferrule here and damaging the edge. It's a genius design that utilizes one component for many features. It's also a much more reliable design than something like the Axis Lock, in which you're relying on two separate Omega springs that are made of very fine wire to operate the lock. Here, you've got this helical spring which is more reliable, less liable to break, and is made out of a heavier stock than the tiny Omega Springs. All right, while we've got this knife apart, we are going to make sure that we give it some lubrication. I've got some knife pivot loop here. We are going to use a drop of that on one of the phosphor bond bearings here on this side. We will place our blade down. With the blade in place, we want to lubricate this bushing here so that when the knife rotates, it's got friction relief both on the bearing surface down here as well as on the internal diameter that interfaces with that pushing for ultimate smoothness. 
On the top side of the blade goes this other phosphor bronze bearing with a little bit of lubrication as well. Place that down. And while we've got the knife here, it's time to replace our old plastic cage with the new one here made out of titanium. To do that, we will take our ball bearing and drop it into the cage. This cage is directional. It has two sides. The top side, relative to the knife, is this side that is more open and that can accept the ball. The bottom side is quite a bit more closed and actually functions as a, as a holder for the ball bearing. It can't slip out of the bottom side. So keeping that orientation in mind, what we're going to do is with the spring not on the tail end of this cage, we're going to slip that cage into position at the same time as we do the blade. Once that is in place, we're going to open the blade as far as it can go, slide that cage forward, and then rotate the housing mechanism down into place like so. All right, now the missing part of this puzzle is how we get the spring onto the tail end of that guide rod here. It is almost impossible to snake it down around this backspacer here. What we can do, however, is move that up Put the spring in place and then gently lifting on the spring we can rotate the housing back into place and then tuck that spring down into its position right there. Once that's done carefully so that you don't lose any parts we're going to pull that plunger back allow the knife to rotate partially shut and then putting some downward pressure on this back spacer we can insert the screw into the rear of it right here, fixing it once again into place. That's about the simplest way I found to do this very finicky operation without too much trouble. All right, once that's done, all we've got to do is reinstall the liner to the show side of the knife along with the scale. We're going to do that by placing this component into its position, making sure that the D shape in the liner lines up with the D-shape in the bushing at its top. It is not here, so we're going to use this driver to turn that slightly so that it will align. And place that down. This back end can be hard to get back into place because you've got to push the liner over that expanded end of the ferrule. I find it useful a pair of pliers these are smooth jaw pliers, but if you have jaws that are quite rough, you'll want to put something in there as a cushion so that you don't mar or damage any surfaces. A simple squeeze gets that liner into position, and we will do the same for the scale itself. Gentle squeeze, and you've reinstalled that piece without any substantial damage. Now that we've got those components back together, it's simple enough to add the screws back to the knife. While we're at it, we're going to lock tight each of them so that they don't walk themselves out of the knife under vibration or heavy use. A single drop on each screw will do it. Tighten that to a reasonable level. All right, and once those screws have been added back to the knife, it's time to adjust it for final performance. What we want to do is make sure that the blade is showing as centered between the two scales of the knife. This one's not quite. And also that we don't have any side to side play when the blade is open, but that we're still getting drop shut action from the blade itself. I'm going to do a little bit of fine tuned adjusting to get the action just right. <laughs> All right, and with just a little bit of adjustment to those pivot screws, we've got a knife that falls shut easily, flips open easily as well, and just feels awesome in the hand. That new cage really adds a lot to the knife. It gives you a much sharper and easier to grip surface with those metal ridges and makes things much smoother overall. I've been very, very pleased with the tool set 
from Journey Tool Co. If you guys are at all interested, go ahead and pick one of these up. They are awesome and contain really everything you need to get a job done right. Thanks for joining me today, guys. The Manix 2 is an awesome knife. It is truly Eric Glesser's magnum opus and one of my favorite EDCs. We'll see you guys next time. Talk to you later.